Yeah, so we, we pretty much got a whole new set of uh, features coming in, in OpenShift 4.2. And the slides were updated yesterday around 7 p.m. And uh, uh, I also went to watch uh, the game yesterday from Inter. So we should talk about that if you guys want to talk about that. It wasn't that great. I don't know. But uh, but anyway, I'd like to introduce myself. My name is William. I'm a product manager uh, at OpenShift, and I have here with me uh, Chris. But uh, yeah, let's get the mic. I'm just deployed to production yet. Um, so I'm Chris Bloom. I'm from the Storage BU. Nice. And we're going to then uh, talk a little bit about uh, what's coming in 4.2 and a little bit of all the different features that we have throughout the platform uh, as well. Uh, this is going to build uh, very nicely on what Brian already uh, talked, because again, like some of these slides will be already, uh, uh, we were, they were already covered by him. That's great, because I have a lot to talk about here. Uh, but with 4.2, we have uh, some specific teams that we were uh, tackling uh, as part of this release, right? Uh, one of the things that we, we uh, got as feedback from customers, for example, was around uh, air-gapped uh, installs. So we uh, are provisioning that now as one of the features in the platform. Uh, we did a lot as well to uh, expand the, the workloads that we can now run in the platform, uh, more specifically uh, enabling uh, GPUs to run uh, a little bit uh, easily on Kubernetes. And then, of course, uh, a lot of the features that we have now uh, as, as part of our developer experience and developer tools that also run on top of the platform. So uh, Brian already mentioned this. Uh, uh, one of the things that you get with every OpenShift 4 cluster is uh, uh, telemetry. Uh, you can, uh, it's, it's an optional thing. Again, you can disable that if you want. But by enabling that, you do allow uh, this backend system that we have at uh, uh, at Red Hat to read this kind of metadata about your cluster, so it's all anonymized and whatnot. But with this data, we can not only see the, the overall health of your cluster, but we can also uh, let you know that, for example, uh, a new CVE came up, and you also have, for example, a cluster that need to be patched in order to get that CVE uh, uh, applied. Uh, we also found, again, like a number of bugs that uh, for, I would say, like 20% of them, we or able to detect those bugs and let our customers know without actually talking directly with those customers. So that was pretty much only based on the data that we received through the telemetry. Uh, with uh, 4.2, uh, we are adding some new uh, platforms and new providers that we can now support through the two different ways that you can install uh, OpenShift 4, uh, if you're not familiar with that. We have pretty much uh, two ways to provision infrastructure for OpenShift 4. One is called IPI, and the other one is called UPI. So with IPI, it's what we call the uh, installer provision infrastructure. Uh, that is pretty much, I'd say, the, the easiest way to get an OpenShift 4 cluster up and running. Uh, and with, uh, with that installation, uh, we pretty much manage the whole stack. So from the operating system to all the different uh, uh, network settings and the, the creation of those resources on these different cloud providers, like everything is then provisioned and configured uh, for you uh, using the installer. Uh, but as an alternative, you also can uh, use the user provided infrastructure, and that's pretty much then you are on the hook in order to. The mic not working properly? Not yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, so with UPI, you can then you are then on the hook to provide uh, the infrastructure, the networking, and the operating system and whatnot. But then you we just use the installer to install the OpenShift bits on top of that infrastructure, right? Uh, so if you're going to then uh, so let's say kind of summarize all uh, this this different ways that you can uh, install OpenShift uh, on the OpenShift uh, uh, on the OCP side, as we call it, right? We have then this full automated install, the pre-existing install. And we have also, of course, the, the hosted offerings uh, that we have in two flavors as well. One of the flavors is uh, what we call ARO, or Azure Red Hat OpenShift. So with that way, you are running OpenShift, but that's uh, managed jointly by uh, Red Hat engineers and Microsoft engineers. You can uh, create uh, an OpenShift cluster directly from the 
Azure uh, console. That's kind of very nice if you are an Azure customer. Uh, but we also offer another flavor of that, which is OpenShift dedicated. And with OpenShift dedicated, the, the management of that cluster is then done by the, the Red Hat engineering team and our SREs. Uh, if we are then uh, pretty much putting that side by side, the UPI and IPI uh, installation modes, this is what the, the installer provides for you. So again, it's pretty much automated uh, all the way. But then you have also the, the, the things that you as a user have to provide when you're doing the UPI route. But the installer can still do some of that for you. Uh, for example, generating, for example, the, the configuration of uh, uh, ignition. And I'll get into more details about that later throughout the talk. Uh, looking at the, the specifics of how that uh, materializes for you as a user, uh, you see here, for example, uh, the installation procedure on Azure and the installation procedure on GCP. It's pretty much the same thing. Again, if you're not familiar with OpenShift 4, you download this installer called OpenShift install. It's a binary. And when you run that binary, you can pretty much uh, say create cluster. It's going to pop up and ask you a few questions, which cloud provider you want to use, your credentials or SSH keys and whatnot. And from there, you pretty much hit enter and let the installer run for 30 minutes, 40 minutes, and you got a cluster up and running that is pretty much ready uh, to, to rock as a production ready, production grade uh, installation. Uh, it's very, I'd say, straightforward. And you can see how that's uh, uh, compatible and, and uh, very similar experience across all these different providers. Specifically with 4.2, we are adding uh, GCP support uh, and Azure as well. Uh, just expanding a little bit on that uh, disconnected installs, uh, even though uh, a lot of the installation and the procedure that we have been describing about OpenShift 4, it, uh, it relies, of course, on connectivity with the internet and with those backend systems at, at Red Hat. Uh, we also heard uh, feedback from multiple customers, especially the ones uh, running uh, in industries like, uh, of course, banking and help and whatnot, that they want to run uh, complete air-gapped installation procedures. So we are now offering that as well with 4.2. Uh, but because, of course, you still want some of that uh, experience that you get for uh, running uh, upgrades for, let's say, multiple clusters that you have running on your infrastructure, uh, you can still do that. But you'd have to, of course, have a local copy of those containers and those patches and those updates available uh, behind your firewall. And that's kind of what we allow you to do now with 4.2. Uh, another feedback that we heard from uh, our enterprise customers was around uh, the need for uh, egress proxy. So again, like sometimes you have to uh, go through a corporate proxy in order to do any kind of uh, connectivity to the internet and whatnot. Uh, and this is kind of a nice way to uh, configure the entire OpenShift cluster, the entire Kubernetes, Kubernetes clusters, and all those services to go through this proxy. But you can configure that now from like a centralized location in, in the cluster. Uh, Specifically talking about OpenShift 4.2 and what version of Kubernetes is available with 4.2, that's 1.14. Uh, one thing to notice here is that as we transition from 4.1 to 4.2 to 4.3, we're skipping one version of Kubernetes. And that is something that we, we can do and we will do uh, when we think that's uh, uh, something that makes sense. So we're looking at the features available in OpenShift 1.15, and we are looking at the versions in 1.16. Given the timelines that we have to ship the 4.3 release, we're like, ah, I think we can skip that version and get the, the upgrade and the update handled by the platform for you. So again, this is something that uh, if you're looking for a specific feature in Kubernetes, uh, it's good to know. But if you are not as much concerned about that, but you are concerned about the whole upgrade process, even though we're skipping a version there, that is all handled uh, by us, by, by OpenShift. I mentioned uh, this uh, capability of enabling GPUs in Kubernetes. If this is something that you are uh, you have tried to do in Kubernetes uh, before, uh, you know that it's not the most uh, uh, straightforward uh, procedure. And you know that there are a lot of specifics according to the uh, implementation of GPU or the provider of that GPU that you have to uh, do at, those, uh, at, the, at the cluster level, right, Pro drivers and whatnot. So we are automating that and simplify that using an operator that we call uh, NFD. 
and through this operator, again, you pretty much have a click install experience to enable GPU in every single loan that you have a GPU available. Very, I'd say, uh, powerful and uh, easy to use. Again, if you're doing any kind of AI ML workloads, this is something that you'll be very interested in uh, leverage that. I'll transition now to Chris to cover. Some uh, so I was told that you, uh, not everyone could hear me earlier, so I'm Chris from Storage View. And um, one of the cool things that we got, uh, or we're about to get in 4.2, is uh, we will have the CSI, the container storage interface in there, and that will enable us to uh, uh, add plugins, storage plugins, to Kubernetes uh, that are not in the Kubernetes tree. So we don't have to uh, commit code to the Kubernetes project and wait for every Kubernetes release to get updates there. We can uh, develop that much quicker and then just use the CSI interface there. And um, the OpenShift container storage plugin will leverage that, but we also have uh, a couple of third party um, developers that uh, provide plugins there. Uh, looking at the storage devices, um, the storage operator will automatically set up the um, default storage class uh, depending on where you deploy your uh, OpenShift cluster. So if you go in AWS, you already have a default AWS storage class and you can go ahead and uh, directly use that storage class or if you're in VMware, you have that available as well. Um, and the cool thing uh, additionally is we got uh, local volume and the raw block as well. So you can use whatever's locally available on your OpenShift nodes. And you can also forward raw blocks into your containers to use for whatever you need. And that's especially helpful if you want to deploy something that's IO intensive like databases or anything like that. Um, looking at uh, OpenShift container storage, um, we do get a completely new backend. So previously in OpenShift 3, that was backed by ClusterFS. And now we're switching that over to Ceph and Nuba. And uh, um, for the Ceph part, we're going to use Rook. And for the Nuba part, we're going to call this the multi-cloud gateway. Um, as everything in OpenShift 4, is based on operators. This will also have an operator to cover the install and the life cycle, including updates, migrations, and everything. Um, and out of the box, it is designed to work at scale. So if you have a lot of PVs, then this is correctly designed for you already. Um, we also correctly identify availability zones in your uh, clusters. So we will try to uh, replicate uh, between those availability zones so you, you never lose your storage, obviously. Um, and another thing is we're very closely integrated with OpenShift. So you do get your uh, storage monitoring out of the box as well. And um, just to give you a quick uh, look at that, this is when everything is good, it's all green, you see your capacity um, and your consumers, they're all help happy about it. And then um, when a node fails, this uh, all goes in, into red and uh, you see that obviously something has failed. Uh, you probably can't read it, but a node failed in this case and then we do see that you're supposed to do something. And this in the back end also hooks into Prometheus, so you get the alerts to wherever you configured. Um, and if you already use OpenShift uh, 3 and you're wondering, hey, how do I get over to OpenShift 4, then uh, we do have a migration tool for that. So the migration tool will get you from OpenShift 3 over to OpenShift 4. And that will also include uh, the persistent storage. So you will be able to migrate over from your um, OpenShift container storage that's cluster-based 
over to the OpenShift container storage that's uh, Ceph and Nuba based. All right. Thank you, Chris. Uh, so let's continue here. Uh, you heard a, a little bit about uh, cloud.redhat.com. So that's our uh, backend system to manage uh, the installation of OpenShift across all these different uh, platforms and providers that we have. Uh, so some of the updates for that particular uh, uh, system, right? We call it uh, OCM, uh, OpenShift Cluster Manager. And in that view now, uh, one of the things that we are adding in OpenShift 4 is the ability that from, from that uh, single uh, console, you can uh, pretty much launch into your specific OpenShift cluster console uh, straight from, from, from that view, right? So again, uh, as you manage like tens, hundreds of clusters, like that is something that uh, it's quite handy. Uh, from, from that same uh, view, you also see right there in the corner that, for example, one of the uh, uh, versions of OpenShift that you're running, uh, there's a, a, an update available. And again, since we ship those updates over the air, from there, you can click update and you have the cluster then download and perform the update for you. Again, that's a very, I would say, streamlined experience to uh, this kind of uh, Software, right? Especially if you're considering how complicated it can be to uh, update a Kubernetes cluster. Like this is uh, amazingly easy. Uh, another thing that we are adding to this view is the ability to do uh, cluster monitoring as well. So in this screenshot, we we don't have that here, but there is a new tab there uh, uh, at the top called monitoring that gives you access into like high-level monitoring data for uh, for that particular cluster. Uh, let's see what else. Oh, and of course, from, from this uh, uh, interface as well, you can also create a new cluster uh, using OSD. So if you want to create like a new managed cluster, you can manage, uh, you can view the status of that cluster and create a new cluster from here as well. Uh, specifically talking about metering, metering in 4.2 now is uh, considered a GA feature. Uh, and with metering, you can pretty much uh, see uh, consumption of resources for your uh, cluster and break that down per namespace, per pod, or uh, even, of course, cluster-wide as well. Uh, this is something that comes also very handy, uh, especially if you're running this across multiple providers. Sometimes it's very hard to understand where your consumption actually is going, which pod or which application is actually taking most of the resources that you are uh, running in your cluster. And this is a kind of a way to do that. Again, it doesn't matter where you're running, you get this consistent view and report for that particular data set. Uh, with cluster logging, specifically if you're running uh, 3.11, uh, starting with 4.1, we already made a lot of progress towards uh, uh, optimization and performance. We are able now to store pretty much uh, three times the amount of uh, logs in the, same, uh, in the same cluster, but we are also reducing uh, uh, general resource consumption by 50%. So it's a lot of improvements there. And with, uh, with 4.2, we're also integrating the, the monitoring of this uh, uh, logging infrastructure into the general cluster monitoring as well. And you start to get alerts for when that infrastructure is not working properly. So uh, this is all good. Now you have your, uh, I'd say, base platform infrastructure running, but you also now want to bring these workloads to, uh, to your platform. And Brian touched a little bit on how uh, operators work and also that we have an operator hub. I would highly encourage for you to uh, browse the operator hub and see if there is anything there that it might be interesting for you or to create your own operators and submit it there as well. But we also embed uh, uh, an operator hub experience inside the OpenShift cluster for you. And as by, by doing that, we also bring, I would say, kind of a special class of operators as well. So those are, of course, our Red Hat products and also uh, certified operators that they went through a very uh, rigorous process through Red Hat to certify that those operators uh, respect like security concerns and all sorts of other validations that we do. Uh, and that's kind of another, I'd say, peace of mind for you as an administrator that when you're uh, uh, using those operators, those are, uh, I'd say, 
consistent, right? Uh, with 4.2, we are also adding a new capability uh, with operators and OLM. That's the uh, automated dependency resolution. So if you're building an operator that, for example, depends on another operator until 4.1, you could do this declaration of dependency, but it was static. So you could just like let the cluster know, but you'd still have to do some work to install the dependent uh, for, for that operator, the dependency. Uh, with 4.2, we are now handling that automatically. And for example, in this case, if your operator depends on Jaeger and depends on CockroachDB, uh, you don't have to install those. The, the OLM, the operator lifecycle management, is going to then uh, pull those dependencies and configure that for your operator. Uh, now, let's talk a little bit about the OpenShift console, because we also did a lot of uh, improvements here uh, in 4.2. One of the things that we are uh, adding here to the cluster is the ability to extend uh, the console uh, for uh, ISVs. So again, as you provision your uh, operator on the cluster, you have now the ability to extend the console and configure it a little bit how that experience is going to look like and let's say uh, expose your console or your, C your, your CLI inside the OpenShift console itself. Like this is something that is very powerful. Again, if you want to customize how your customers are going to see your operator, your uh, uh, software inside OpenShift. Uh, we are also uh, adding a new dashboard. Again, as you log in into OpenShift 4, uh, you get this nice summary view of like what's happening with your cluster, what's the overall health status, and whatnot. But we are adding a, a, a couple more things here in 4.2 around like top consumers. Uh, you can filter that now by resource, by CPU and memory network and whatnot. And this is one of the really uh, cool features that we are adding to 4.2. It's something that we're calling the developer console or the developer perspective. Uh, there is this now toggle at the top of the console that you can go back and forth between the admin view or the developer view. The nice thing here is again, like as a developer, maybe you don't care as much about like what's happening at the SDN or at the, at the network level or with all the specifics that are happening at the cluster. You can really just focus on building code, deploying your application, and what's happening with all my applications running. Like this is something that is it looks really nice, and we have more demos and more slides on that too. For example, using the developer console. If you want to create a new application, you have like a couple of flows, a guided flows that you can use. Uh, for example, maybe you want to start from Git. Uh, you pretty much input the, the, the GitHub repo there. Uh, you say a couple things around like what kind of application that is. It's a Java application, it's a Python application. You hit create. Behind the scenes, we're going to clone that GitHub repo, trigger a build, wait for the build to complete, push that to the internal container registry, and make their application deployed available for you. That same flow now works for uh, a couple different kinds of workloads, such as, for example, serverless applications or uh, traditional Kubernetes deployments as well. And once that application is then deployed, this is pretty much what you get. You have like a topology view that lets you see what are the applications that I have deployed in my namespace, what's the relationship of those applications, Maybe you want to access the logs for that particular pod. It's all very intuitive and integrated now, right? Another uh, uh, thing that you can see is the relationship between those applications. Again, maybe you want to group that in some way that makes sense. Uh, you can now create like this, this artificial grouping saying that this application and this other application, they're part of a broad, like a bigger component, right? And, and kind of orchestrate that. You can, of course, auto scale that application here, or I'd say manually scale the application here using the console, or if you're deploying that as a serverless workload, that is going to auto scale, and you can see that here as well. Uh, as we talk about, of course, the developer console, let's talk a little bit about the developer tools. Uh, one of the things that Brian also touched was on code ready workspaces uh, with 4.2. We are, or actually, it's not with 4.2, but right after 4.2, because uh, Code Ready Workspaces doesn't actually follow the same exact schedule as OpenShift. It's shipped as an operator that you can install uh, uh, and you can release in a different cadence. But uh, right after 4.2, we'll be uh, releasing uh, Code Ready Workspaces 2.0 that is based on Eclipse GS7. Uh, uh, there's a lot of uh, new uh, capabilities in this release, and it's the one release that I'd say it's like was 
really uh, uh, re-architected to run uh, on top of Kubernetes. So I'll highly encourage taking a look at that as well. One of the things that we announced last week or two weeks ago, sorry, not sure, but we announced recently is uh, code-ready containers. So code-ready containers is a way for you to have pretty much everything I'm talking about here, an OpenShift 4 cluster running on your laptop. Sure, you do need uh, uh, some kind of powerful machine, but you do get all those things installed and the pretty much like you have these three steps, like you set up, start, and you have an OpenShift 4 cluster running on your laptop uh, with all the operators that you want. You can install more operators if you like. That's also something uh, that's, uh, that's very nice and that's delivered on, uh, let's say, multiple platforms as well. So Linux, Windows, and Mac. Uh, one of the things that with 4.2 we are uh, releasing as developer preview is the op OpenShift pipelines or the new version of the OpenShift pipelines based on Tecton. Tecton, if you're not familiar with it, uh, it's, a, it's a new project that was uh, created based on, based on Knative. Like it started with Knative and now it moved to be a standalone project and it lives now under the CICD foundation, the Cloud Native, uh, the Continuous Delivery Foundation. It's another foundation under the Linux Foundation. Foundation, foundation, foundation. But uh, it's, it's, a, it's a new modern CI CD uh, platform that uh, it was designed to run on top of Kubernetes. It was designed to deal with containers. So again, some of the assumptions that you see from more traditional CI CD systems, like they, they're pretty much now revisited and you can re-architect that to be, I'd say, uh, designed for these modern applications and modern workloads. Uh, it runs as an operator, of course. It's one of the, let's say, uh, three like flagship operators that we ship as add-ons to the platform. Pipelines is one. Another one is OpenShift Serverless. Uh, I will have a whole session talking about this in the afternoon. I won't dive into details right now, but Suffice to know that I'm really happy to announce that this is now a tech preview in 4.2 and we are marching towards uh, making it a GA in the future release. Uh, and you learn more about all this in the afternoon talk. Uh, service Mesh as well, I'll mention more about that in the afternoon talk, but with 4.2 we are making Service Mesh now GA, which is something that I'm really proud and happy to announce, again, given that uh, uh, it took us quite some time because, again, Istio and everything that was happening in that community and whatnot, if you're following that, you know a little bit about the history, but we're happy to, to, to say that it, it reached that uh, maturity level down that we're very comfortable saying that it's a GA technology in the platform. And with that, I'll pretty much end with the high-level roadmap, but I have covered all, if not most of the items here already throughout the slides. Uh, I may uh, have went through quickly uh, for uh, some of them, but as you might imagine, like this whole session is usually delivered by 10 or 12 PMs for two hours. So I kind of managed to try to summarize here for 30 minutes for you. Hopefully that went through well. Uh, and that's pretty much it. Thank you. <laughs>